The reading for today was in Colossians, and as I was reading it this morning, the Lord really began to speak to my heart again. And this is the precious thing about when we all read the Bible together and we're reading the same stuff together, that the Lord can speak to all of our hearts together. And it's a very beautiful thing that He does. And I just want to begin um, not in Colossians, but in John. So let's go to John 14 verses 6 to 7. Father, bless your word, anoint it now as we just come before you, and may you give me insight that I can share with these people from your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. John 14, 6 to 7. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus is the one who reveals the Father to us. We must have a right understanding of who Jesus is, because if we don't understand who he is, we won't know who the Father is. If we want to access the Father, we need to understand that we access him through Jesus. Jesus said that no one comes to the Father except through him. We cannot access the Father by our good works. We cannot access the Father by moral living. We cannot access the Father by the money in your pocket. You cannot access Him by your spiritual performance. You certainly can't access Him, I'm sorry, Catholics, by praying to Mary. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes but through me. And so we have to understand that Jesus is the way we access the Father. If we know Jesus, we know the Father. The problem is we kind of don't get this. What do I mean by that? Well, we kind of know Jesus in this kind of airy-fairy way, you know, like, yeah, I understand who Jesus is, but what we know best is what's happening right in front of us the people that are in front of us, the circumstances that surround us. You know, what we think about during the day, and I don't think I'm the only one in this place, is mostly about what's happening to us at that moment. You know, I don't think we spend hours and hours thinking about who Jesus is during the day. We think about what's happening around us during the day, what is immediately in front of us. This could look like our circumstances. It could look like gossip. It could look like news about corona. I mean, we've, we, we, we're just like so up to here with news about corona. It's been going on for many months. You know, it's all we've kind of known on TV, on the radio, in the newspapers. You know, we can know about what every visiting prophet or speaker has got to say. We can know all these things, but what we really need to know is who Jesus is. Because when we know Jesus, we know the Father. And so we need to investigate who he is. We need to read his word. We need to examine Jesus. Jesus went on to say in John 14 in verse 8, well, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. The authority of God, the power of God resides in in Jesus. When you see Christ, you see the Father. When you see Jesus, you see a star-breathing God who created the heavens and the earth and everything in between, and you see a star-breathing God who's got purpose for you, got a, a reason for you to live, and He loves you so much. And all of His authority, all of His power was put in Christ. He is a God of unlimited power. You know, this coronavirus, they they have a picture of it on 
TV, you've probably seen it like it's a round ball and it's got these kind of things coming out of it. It looks ugly, right? I, I don't know if they tried to make it as ugly as they could, you know, to try and attract your attention and think of it as this evil thing, but it looks ugly. And the power of corona is not in what it looks like, but the fear that it generates. And we have whole systems shutting down around our world, not because corona looks like this thing. You know, we're not attracted to it because of what it looks like. The world is attracted to it in a sense of it shuts down and obeys things that can try and stop it because of what it does. The power that it represents. And, you know, I don't want to get into an argument about all of the different, you know, theories around corona. My point is that it's not what makes something powerful is not what it looks like, but what it represents. You know, you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror and think about what you look like, but what's going to make demons shake before you is not how pretty you look like. You know, how long your hair is, how, how, how thin you are, how tall you are. Demons don't shake in their boots because of what you look like, but because of what you represent. Come on, hell gets shut down because of what we represent, not because of what we look like. And you know, you're looking at your past, you're looking at what you've done. Man, that doesn't define you. The power you represent defines you. And that's the power of a star-breathing God, a God who has all authority and it's placed in Christ. And the power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. And you can shut down demonic systems coming against you, against your family, against your purpose by understanding who Christ is in you. Not because you look pretty or you look ugly or whatever you think you look like, but because of the power that is in you, that is represented in Christ. If you are worried about what life looks like, if you're worried about what your circumstances look like, if you're worried about what you look like in the mirror, you're not going to have victory. But when you understand who Christ is, come on. Thank you, Ike, you're excited. When you understand who Christ is in you, that's when you start to see the victory won. You see, it's the power in us that overcomes the world. I'll go on further. Verse 12. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. He represents the Father. And when we ask things in his name, we're asking them in the name of the Father. We're determining that we are going to think of God who God really is. And how you believe who God is in your heart is going to determine how you pray. It's going to determine what you do for God. It's going to determine everything about you, what you believe God to be in your deepest heart. Come on, if you believe that God is a judgmental God, if you believe that God is an angry God, if you believe that God doesn't really care about you, you're not really going to do much for God. But if you understand God, who God is, the power of a loving God, the authority that is yours, the goodness of God in your heart, when you understand that he's a good God and he's got a good purpose, you will attempt great things for him because you know that he's behind you, his word is backing you and that he is a God who is faithful. The most important thing about you is not what you say, what you do, what you look like, but who you believe God to be in your deepest heart. That is the most important thing about you. Let's listen to what Paul says about this. Colossians 1. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. 
He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We see God as we see Jesus. Right here is the core of understanding to overcoming stuff in our life. You can do nothing outside of Christ. Everything was created through him and for him and we're reconciled to God by him. It's like it's all him. And so we need to really understand who he is what he means, and who he stands for in our life. We can do nothing outside of him. Everything is subject to him. Sin, despair, sickness, doubt, fear must all bow their knee to him because everything was made through him and for him. And he has authority over it all. We're like this little wimpy Christian. But you are a power-packed person when you understand the power that is inside of you. Yes, on the outside, we're just jars of clay, but on the inside, we have a treasure. Colossians 2, 6 to 8. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. There's a key there, a really important key. Overflowing with thankfulness. Were you overflowing with thankfulness this week? <laughs> Come on, let's be honest. Who was not overflowing with thankfulness this week? I mean, you know what overflowing is like? It's like water pouring out of the gutters today because there's rain pouring down on this building. You know, overflowing with thankfulness. I'm not just talking about, oh yeah, thank God we had a good day. No, overflowing with thankfulness. And, you know, one of the reasons why we're not overflowing with thankfulness is because we think we're supposed to be thanking God for what we have. And maybe what we have doesn't look that great this week. <laughs> maybe there's not much money in the bank this week. Maybe you're not feeling that well this week. Maybe you're not even here because you're not real thankful for how you're feeling. And so you felt, I'm going to stay home today. You see, we think we're supposed to be thankful for what we have. And, and you listen to your prayers. Thank you, God, for my job. Thank you, God, for my house. Thank you, God, for my wife. Uh, most of the time, that's our prayer. <laughs> Thank you, God, for my husband. Most of the time, that's our prayer. Sometimes it's not. Why? Because we're not thankful for them because we're mad at them. You know, sometimes we get mad at God because we think we don't have what we're supposed to have. And so we think that thankfulness is about what we have from God. Don't get me wrong, we can thank God for what we have, but what we are really supposed to be overflowing with thankfulness is not for what you have, but because of who He is, because of who Jesus is. You see, whether you have a lot or you have a little, it doesn't change who Jesus is. It doesn't change the power of God in your life to overcome. And so we need to understand that our thankfulness should be rooted in who Jesus is that all authority, all power is His, that He gave His life on a cross for us. That is done. Nothing can change that. That is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is faithful, and that's why we are thankful. And if we base our thankfulness on how many people, you know, like us, and how many people don't like us or how much money we have, you'll be up and down all the time. Your emotions will go up and down and your thankfulness will go up and down because we won't be overflowing because we're thanking Him in a wrong place. We thank Him for what He is, for what He's done and who He always will be. That is the power 
We crash and burn because we're thankful for what we have instead of being thankful for who he is. What you have doesn't matter. What he has matters. He has the cattle on a thousand hills. Man, you, you got 10 cents in your bank. God, I thank you that you have the cattle on a thousand hills. <laughs> you know it, Ike. You know it. You know, people walk into this place and think, wow, what a rich church. It's a big place. If only they knew <laughs> what's in the bank at the end of every month. <laughs> You know, God is faithful and we thank him in that place. I'm glad one person is excited here. <laughs> be content. Paul says it, be content. Whether, whether you're hungry or you're full, whether you've got all the money in the world or none, be content in that place. Your power is not in what you've got. Your power is in Christ in you. It is not your possessions, but what you possess in Christ. Everything of us must be totally submitted and surrendered to his world, his word and his world. If we're having issues in our life, you know, with being able to thank God, with being able to trust God, if we're having issues with people, it's usually because something in our heart is not surrendered to his word. Something is not submitted to his word, you know, because God's word has the answers to everything. And if there's a struggle, you know, we talked about it the last few weeks, right, about relationships and marriage and, and church. And, you know, if there's struggles in our life, it's usually because we're not submitted to the word of God. We're not surrendered in that place. Let's read on to see what Paul has to say in Colossians 2, 9 and 10. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Ephesians 6 says we battle against what? You battle against your spouse? <laughs> battle against your pastor? Battle against your neighbor? Battle against someone at work? Battle against that guy who cut you off in traffic? Is that what Ephesians 6 says we battle against? No, we do not battle against flesh and blood. Amen. Come on, so it doesn't matter what you look like or what you possess because that's what the world cares about and our battle is not with the world. Our battle is with spiritual forces. Amen. And they don't care what you look like in the flesh. They care what you look like inside, what you believe inside, what you understand about Christ inside. That is what they care about. And they're not going to go running from you because you've had a bad hair day. They're going to go running from you because the power of Christ is in you and you know it and you stand on it and you understand it. We get into all these um, battles with people. We get into all these um, confusion about how people treat us or what they do or how we've treated them. We're on the wrong battlefield. That's why we're not overcoming, because we're fighting on the battlefield that God has not called us to fight. He's called us to a spiritual battle. Yeah. Our battle, you can read it in Ephesians 6, I don't have time to go there today, but it is a spiritual battle. And we need to overcome in the spiritual battle. You see, when we fight on the wrong battlefield, we're just draining and draining and draining from our power source. Because our power source is a spiritual source. It's not a physical source. And you can take everything you have and fight with it and get nowhere. Because the, the fight that we need to have is a spiritual fight and the power source is a spiritual source. And, you know, you, you, your phone gets low and what do you do with it? You don't throw it out or say, I don't want my phone anymore. You plug it in and you charge it up. And so we need to get back to an understanding of the battlefield we need to be fighting and plug into the right source as soon as possible so we can be charged correctly. You don't defeat the enemy. Listen to this. You don't defeat the enemy by defeating your spouse. <laughs> you don't defeat the enemy by defeating the person in front of you. 
You don't defeat the enemy by defeating those who oppose you. You defeat the enemy by defeating him on the spiritual battleground. By submitting yourself to God's word. By dying to your personal pride. You know, guys, living in personal pride only leads you to personal defeat. Because it's the devil's playground. He loves to play there and you're fighting in his battlefield. You're fighting with his weapons. But the real battle, the spiritual battle, is won from a place of humility. It's won from a humble heart, submitted and surrendered to God. Christ triumphed over the world and all the spiritual forces of darkness by what? By submission to his Father on a cross. Jesus went to the cross and submitted humbly to his Father on the cross. It was through submission and humility that Christ overcame darkness. In humility, he came before the Father and submitted himself to him. You think you can overcome in your pride? Christ overcame in his humility by giving his life freely on the cross. Let's go to verse 11 and 12 in Colossians 2. In him, you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. (laughs) You see, our circumcision is not a physical one. It's a spiritual one. It's one that God does in our heart. It's a spiritual one. And, you know, when you get circumcised, you probably don't remember it if it happened to you because you were probably a little baby. But when I was in the Philippines, there was this kid, he was about 12, and his parents had decided at 12 years of age to circumcise him. And he was wearing this kind of dress because, you know, it's kind of painful down there and you don't want stuff rubbing. And he was physically circumcised and he felt it and he remembered it. He had to lie down on a bed and get You know, the business done is painful. You know, what religion would make up circumcision? You know, this must be a God thing because no man would make that up. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about the Jewish religion. I want to talk about the circumcision of the heart. You see, many of us are fighting on the battleground of our personal pride because we haven't allowed the Lord to circumcise our heart. Why don't we want our heart circumcised? Because we love our flesh. We love the stuff that controls us in this world. We love what goes on around us. And, and you know, it's kind of like we're on the operating table and we... You know, like we're here on our knees at the altar, we come, we're on the operating table, and then five minutes later, we get off the operating table and go, okay, God, I'm finished now. I actually want to go back to my flesh. And we keep reigning in defeat rather than in victory because we don't understand that once God has circumcised our flesh, once he has circumcised our heart, once he has cut that off, it's gone. Paul says over and over again, you are dead, you are dead, you are dead, you are dead. You're dead to the old man. Why? Because you've been circumcised. It's been cut off. It doesn't grow back, people. But the problem is that we keep getting off the altar and God is calling us to that place of submission and surrender to him, fighting from a place of humility, not pride. Before Christ, our whole self was ruled by the flesh. In Christ, our whole self is ruled by Christ. And submitted to his word. There is nothing left of our will. Everything is him. We must have faith in the power of God working in our life through the knife. Otherwise, we will not be raised from the old man's life to the new man in Christ. Because the old man is still alive and there is no (laughs) no resurrection without crucifixion. We need the old man to be crucified in us. We need to die to him. You know, if you feel hurt, if you feel offense, if you feel struggle, if you feel trial, your old man's still kind of getting up out of the grave and going, I'm here, I'm here, listen to me. 
They need to get back on the altar. Verses 13 to 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. God did not wait for us to go under the knife. He sent his son to go under the knife first. Through Christ's submission, we were forgiven and set free of our debt of sin, which stood against us and condemned us. It has been nailed to the cross. The power of sin and death have been dealt with and done with on the cross. A public spectacle of your sin and your death and your your stuff was made on that cross as he submitted to the nails. Problem is we want the outcome without the process. The process is the circumcision of our fleshly desires. The outcome is no weapon formed against you will prosper. And we want the outcome, yep, no weapon formed against me will prosper. Thank you, God, yes, no weapon formed against me will prosper. But the problem is our heart isn't circumcised. So we're fighting out of pride and every weapon is prospering against you. Every single weapon is prospering against you because your heart hasn't been circumcised. And so the outcome comes from a process. And that process is we're submitted and surrendered to his word. And his word speaks and we obey it. His word speaks and we obey it. He says, go to the left, we go to the left. He says, go to the right, we go to the right. Sorry, I'm freaking out the camera there. It's having to go like a tennis match at the moment. (laughs) This word is our answer and we need to be submitted to it. When God says, be overflowing with thankfulness. We need to be overflowing with thankfulness. Guys, it's not like, oh, today I get to be not overflowing with thankfulness because guess what? God hasn't changed today. He's the same that he was yesterday, today, and forever. And so we are overflowing with thankfulness because of who he is every day because that never changes. What changes is your circumstances. What changes is your attitude. What changes is your emotion. Come on, I'm married. I know. Emotions change every day. But what does not change is God and his authority of his word. But we must be submitted to it. Verses 16 to 19. Therefore, Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. If it is about what you can do or what you know or what you have seen, you have lost connection with the head. It is about Christ and his work in us and our submission to his word. You are cut off from the brain. No wonder you feel brain dead. If your growth is in your own ability, then your end will be defeat. It is only in him. It is his authority in us. Don't get intimate with what's in front of you. Don't get intimate with your problems, the world, what you have or don't have. Be intimate with Christ. Be intimate with your understanding of him. Know him. Know his power of the name of Jesus and be submitted to his word. What does verse 8 tell us? Submit everything, every thought that comes to you, submit it to him. Let, Let it rule you. Do not be held captive, but take every thought captive and submit it to Christ. Don't be ruled by your emotion, your feelings, your circumstances. They are light and momentary troubles before you. Christ is eternal 
and the cross finished death, Christ came to bring life and life abundant. And I just want to finish with this quote from Mark Hankins. Your faith will not prevent all mountains. It will move all mountains. So instead of trying to figure out how this mountain got there, just move it. Don't talk about the mountain. It is just our job to introduce the mountain to God. Open the door to the supernatural and introduce the mountain to Jesus. And say, Jesus, I have faith. I stand on your word. I'm submitted to your word. Mountain, go throw yourself in the sea. In Jesus' name. Any person can be changed by faith, no matter how they are chained. The devil cannot make a bondage that faith cannot break off you. For all the power resides in Christ. Worship team, you can come forward. So Lord, I pray that we go out into this world today and we represent the true power that is in us. That we are overflowing with thankfulness. That we are content in every situation because we know that you never change. That you are the same yesterday, today and forever and that the power in us is the power that makes the demons shake. The power in us that is Christ is the power that gives us victory, that overcomes anything that comes before us and that no weapon formed against us will prosper. And I thank you, Lord, that that is the outcome as we submit and surrender ourselves to allow our heart to be circumcised by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Continue to do that work in our lives. Continue to to show us those things that you want to call us out of, the Egypts, the captivities, the, the chains that bind us, Lord. Continue to reveal to us those things that are holding us back so that we can step out of that place into the place you've called us to. In Jesus' name, amen.